Hey guys, welcome. I'm back on live. This is Vinny here. We're going to be uh, talking about how to become a better diver. Uh, I'm going to cover three specific areas uh, on, on how to achieve this. One is obviously your physical skills. Two is the equipment that you need that will help you here. And the third and the most important part, which I, I think gets really undersold in most courses and in all talk about divers, is the mental part. Yeah? I think that, uh, three of them together can take can take a, uh, can, can re make significant improvements in, in sort of your your diving skills, and not and not just improving your skills, but also improving the degree to which you utilize your skills. Yeah. So without any further ado, let's get started. Um, the first thing we got is obviously physical skills, right? You have to have good diving skills in order to be a good diver. That's pretty obvious. Uh, what do I mean by physical skills? Well, there's a lot of obviously that you know when you did your open water course. You remember you, you, probably, you did 18 skills, right? Mass clearing, reg recovery, etc., etc. And sure, it, it obviously helps to be good in all of them. But I, I think you do, there are probably some skills which you which you probably should be better at, uh, which you overlearn, let's say. And then those skills, uh, for, the first one to me is obviously buoyancy. Uh, you have your buoyancy skills have to be solid because um, that, that is the fundamental basis of becoming a good diver, right? I mean, you cannot be a good diver until you have good buoyancy. And this is where it, 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 uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's something I like to bring to you, uh, uh, to your attention that I think not everyone's really aware of. There's two types of buoyancy. There's what I call dynamic buoyancy, which is what happens when you're swimming around. Are you, you know, when you swim around, are you able to hold your depth, or are you banging into things or floating up? Uh, and that I think for most people, uh, that that's 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 a skill that they acquire fairly quickly, maybe within the first few first few dives of open water, or within a few dives afterwards. The second part, and I think this is the skill that takes a little bit more time to refine, is what is, is static buoyancy. Uh, and I see this all the time. I mean, in almost 90% of the advanced courses I've taught, uh, we, we, I, I take my students along, we go swimming along, la 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 la, and they're looking good in the water. Uh, you know, they're, they're, buoyant, they, 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 you know, they're sort of reasonably good trained, they're not going up, they're not going down, they're looking quite relaxed. But then in a moment I say, okay, stop and hover, people start to sink and the hands start to flap, and you know, and then they kind of go, what just happened? Now keep in mind, buoyancy is a matter of physics. It it doesn't it, it, and it it's not it's not something that is that is linked to uh, you know oh you're more experienced than I am so you're, so so you know so you you can be better or not. Uh, so if if I'm so if I, if I'm if I stop kicking and I start to sink, I'm negatively buoyant. As simple as that. That's not negotiable. That's not up for discussion. It is what it is. So what happens? Why am I? Why am I able to, to swim perfectly well um, uh, in all conditions, but the moment I stop, why do I start sinking? The reason for this is because you're actually not negatively buoyant, uh, not negative, neutrally buoyant, you're negatively buoyant. So when you swim, part of your kick is propelling you forwards, and part of your kick is propelling you upwards. It's keeping you off the bottom. When you stop kicking, when you don't have that assist that comes from your kick, you start to sink. Now, it, does it really matter that much? You know, if, if, you're, if, you're, if you're able to dive and enjoy yourself and not have any problems, is it really such a big issue? Yes and no, right? I mean, obviously, if it's not a problem, it's not a problem. That's, that's, that's pretty self-evident. But if you start getting the things like you want to stop and observe something, and the moment you stop, you start to sink, and you start flapping your hands, you lose your buoyancy, what happens then? Obviously, one is you're going to kick, the, kick, kick up the silt. You can damage coral below you. And you start to get tired, you, you become inefficient, you use up your air faster, your dive lasts shorter. So I think it's, it's one of the very important skills for, for, or like for intermediate divers, let's say divers who have about 10 to 20 uh, dives, is to develop the, the, the static buoyancy skills. When you swim, you should be able to swim quite in a nice and relaxed manner. When you stop, you should stay where you are. Uh, this is, it's very easy to, 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 uh, to test this. Next time you go diving, try it out. You, uh, five minutes into a dive, just stop kicking, put your hands here and see what happens. If you stay where you are, good. If you start to sink, maybe it's time to, work, uh, time to refine your buoyancy a little bit further. Okay, so that is the second part of the link to, link to buoyancy is trim. Trim is your body position in which you, uh, in which you swim. I can be neutrally buoyant like this. I can be neutrally buoyant like this. I can be neutrally buoyant like this. Uh, tech divers really need to be perfectly horizontal. Perfectly horizontal. I will tell you that for recreational divers, this is probably not the best place to be. If, if you're like this, your head is down, you can't really see what's above you. It actually helps to be slightly head up. Not too much. If you're too much, you're, it's not very really efficient. Uh, when you're swimming against a current, your body acts like a sail and the current lifts you up. You want to be fairly close to horizontal, but slightly tilted up so you can actually look around and 
see what's around you. After all, that's why you're diving, right? You're not diving to 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 to, to get uh, bonus points for how flat you are. You get di- you're diving to go see to see things in the water. Uh, so good trim basically means that you're able to hold whatever body body position you want without sort of losing it. If you if you if you if you're looking at something macro, you want to be head down. You should be able to ho- go head down and look at it without sort of you know losing balance. If you're looking up to see mantas, you should be able to be slightly head up. And, and uh, again, not sort of roll over to side backwards or whatever. Uh, good trim comes from, um, it, sort of, it, it, it starts with actually having your buoyancy down. Uh, the second part of getting good trim is actually ref- is minimizing the amount of weights that you use. When you have, it's very simple, if you have one extra kilo on, on, on your weight belt or whatever, you have to have one extra liter of air in your BCD to compensate. Imagine this is the diver, this is my head, and this is my BCD, and this is my waist. If I have one extra kilo, there's one extra kilo pulling me down and one, extra, one, uh, one liter of air here pulling me up. So what happens when this pulls me up and this pulls me down? I go like this. So the more weight you have, the more air you have in your BCD to compensate, the more likely you are to go le- leg down, head up. So, so the first part of getting good trim is minimizing the amount of weight that you use. Those of you who've done a buoyancy course and advanced class with me know that this is something I really, really stress, right? Right from the first dive. I work on sort of getting your weight down to, to as little as possible. In the beginning, it can be actually it can be a bit of an issue, right? Because you're used to being slightly heavy. I remember what I said about your buoyancy earlier. And when I take that extra weight off, uh, suddenly, you know, if you kick the same way, you start going up. Yes, there's an adjustment period. So in the short term, it can be a bit uh, uh, clunky. You might feel a little bit, you know, what's going on? I was doing really fine until you start, you got involved in it. What are you doing? In the long term, this works really well. So get your weight down to as little as possible. The second part of that is then figure out the weight distribution. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, depending on your body type, I have long legs and so my legs tend to sink. So for me, I need to get my weights up as high as possible to compensate for my legs. Other people might have lighter legs that tend to float. So they might be better off with their legs coming down. Uh, anyway, so weight distribution, this, this is something you figure out by trial and error, right? So weight distribution is, 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 the, is the second part of uh, what, makes, what makes your point C, uh, what makes your trim um, work better. And the last thing is, 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 is actually your fins. I mean, if you if you look at if you look at I'm, I'm six I'm about six feet tall. Um, if I if if, if if I'm like this uh, and I have the fins, the fins are the, actually the furthest part of my body from my center of gravity. So any if my fins are heavier, the moment the, the degree of torque they put on my center of gravity is the highest. So if I were to wear really heavy fins, it's, it's even slightly heavy fins actually, it throws off my trim really really fast. Um, so and for some people, it, it might be the other way around. They might find that lighter fins throw off their trim. So, fi- so yeah, so it's, it's your, your, your fins, your weighting, and they all work together in sort of achieving good trim. And once you have your buoyancy sorted and once you have good trim, your, it, diving really becomes effortless. What you really should be doing is you should be thinking of diving and kicking, 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 kick, kick, kick from you know, point A to point B. It should be you float, one kick, you glide. One kick, you glide. So it's basically, it's, 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 it's a series of hovers with just one kick to move you from one place to the other. So it's kick, hover, kick, hover. So this is something that, uh, that, that I think, I, said, I, think I guess a lot of people with let's say five to 20 dives can, can benefit from practicing, uh, from, from improving this skill. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit later on how you can actually work on this. Yeah? Obviously one is take a class, <laughs> take a class with us, we'll appreciate it, but there's also ways to do it for cheaper as well. I'll talk about that. Uh, okay, so now leaving buoyancy and trim aside, there's also equipment manipulation. And by equipment manipulation, I mean you should be able to sort of do things like inflate your BCD, find out where your inflate, your emergency releases are, <coughs> your shoulder releases are, etc. It should be second nature for you. And this is something you can actually do while you're sitting at home. If you have your own BCD, put it on. Try doing things and, you know, figuring out where your inflator is, touching things, uh, tightening your straps, loosening your straps, etc. Um, equipment manipulation is uh, it's it's really helpful because if you are in a situation where let's say you have to help someone or you're dealing with let's say a strong current or whatever uh, you have a finite amount of sort of brain power cognitive resources that that that, that you have available to you if in, during a crisis I still have to figure out where's my inflator hose uh, where's my emergency release I'm fumbling out with all of this that takes away share of my share of my attention that leaves me with less mind space to devote to maybe swimming in the current or keeping an eye on my body or you know or whatever. So the more automatic, the more automatic you can make these skills, the better it is for you in the long run. Because um, stuff like 
you know, t- tightening your fin strap, tightening your BCD should be second nature. It shouldn't require any cognitive effort on your part. Uh, and this comes to repetition. Okay. Um, another thing that actually also gets gets better with repetition is emergency skills. Now, and uh, or just basically it's dealing with some common issues that you might face face underwater, like clearing your mask. Um, I always tell people that you know one of the things that uh, that should that you should absolutely have. Uh, just just once again, someone is saying there's an error. So is there an error? Uh, Arush, you saying there's an error? Uh, I'm not sure what it is. Um, I'll be putting this on live uh, on, on on live later again, and we'll also be on Instagram on Saturday. So maybe if you if it's not working for you, you can catch up there. Anyway, getting back to where we were talking, about, so there's some skills that you that you really should be should overlearn. Uh, and, and like I said, not all skills uh, obviously you learn to the same degree. Yes, if you can, great. But in the real world, some skills probably require more attention than the other. For me, the first one is mask clearing. Uh, and when I say mask clearing, it shouldn't be like oh, if I sit and say you. Clear your mask. You can be like, okay, what do I do? I go, yeah, I hold this. And do that. Yeah, okay, that that's okay. That's a start. But you should be at the point where if I come in and the dive and just take your mask off your off your face and give it to you, you should be like, I mean, you're a jackass, and you should calmly take it back from me, put it on, clear it, and you know, flip me the bird or whatever, uh, <laughs> or thank me for testing your skills. Anyway, uh, so yeah. So because the reason for this is. Uh, most mask clearing is one of the is actually it's one of the first skills you learn. It's also one of the, the hardest skills for many people to acquire because you're not used to getting water in your face. Uh, if you learn it when you're prepared for it, it's great. But if you're diving and suddenly someone to you know maybe accidentally dislodge the mask from your face, like Saeed Salim, Salim hitting me on the face and uh, with his tank, uh, or getting kicked on the face or whatever, you have a mask that leaks suddenly. Uh, you shouldn't panic. Uh, because th- this is one of the things where, which the biggest cause of accidents with beginners actually. When the mask leaks suddenly, they panic and they bolt to the surface. This is a skill that should be absolutely rock solid for everyone. You should be able to just, like I said, at any point just have your mask ripped off your face and not really have any issues with it. Second, obviously, air sharing. This, this is a skill that, that, that also become, is, is really useful to have because, let's face it, again, when you practice this skill, uh, you, you know, you know someone's going to come to you, give you an out of air signal, etc. What really happens in the real world is if I run out of air, you're not going to be facing me with your rag in hand. You're probably going to be somewhere else, looking somewhere else. I have to, and uh, and also when I lose, when I run out of air, it's not when I breathe in a full lung of air. It's when I exhale and I try to breathe in, and oh, I got nothing. So with empty lungs, you're, the the stress level goes up significantly. So imagine this: I, I'm in the water, or you're in the water. You've exhaled, you try to breathe in, you get nothing. With empty lungs, you have to swim out to your buddy. You have to get their attention. You have to tap them and say, hey, buddy, would you mind sharing some air, please? Thank you very much, your buddy. goes, shoot me, my friend. Here you go. No, that's not what happens. If you're lucky, someone's going to smack you upside the head and take the rag from your mouth. And that's all the warning you'll, you'll get. You should be prepared for this. If someone comes, so the first thing is, make sure you know where your octopus is. Because 90% of the time, if you're in an out of air emergency, you're the one who's going to be needing it. Your buddy's going to take the rag from your mouth. Or if you're lucky, hey, you can hand it to them. I've actually been on a dive. I've seen a guy who's had his octopus uh, between his back and his BCD with the, the hose dangling somewhere around his right hip. I'd hate to be his buddy, or I'd hate to be him in case of an autoimmune emergency. That's just a disaster waiting to happen, right? So again, uh, it, you know, regardless of whether you're the donor or the receiver in an out of an emergency, it's a pretty stressful time, right? Uh, so at that point, again, you don't want to be fumbling around, oh, where's my octopus, where are you, whatever. This is a skill that should be fairly, uh, fairly self-evident. Without thinking, just, you should be able to grab and uh, hand out your octopus without too much cognitive effort. This is also a skill that you should overlearn. And one other skill that's, that I think is, is really important uh, is, is actually doing a safety stop. Um, most of most, the time when you learn to dive, you, you, we, as instructors, we typically tend to pick sites that are conducive to learning. And when you become a certified diver, sometimes, you know, you dive in conditions where, hey, you know, they may not be the best of conditions. There might be a strong current. You may not be able to make it back to the anchor line. You may have to do a safety stop in the blue. Uh, so one very useful skill to learn is actually need, uh, doing a, uh, is, is knowing how to do a safety stop in blue water without visual reference and also knowing how to shoot a lift back. Um, you can practice that on the surface and then practice it underwater. It's, it's a bit fumbling. Uh, it takes a few attempts to, uh, to get it right. And I'm seeing if uh, Jugal is here because, uh, okay, no comments, Jugal, you're not here. Um, <laughs> sometimes it can make for very hilarious um, things if you're a viewer when, when someone starts to shoot a lift bag and sort of go up with the bag. Um, it sounds more complex, so, but it, this is one of the skills where it's, it's useful to practice because, again, 
the, the times you need it are going to be the times when sort of the condition not not ideal. It's it's actually rough and uh, and maybe there's a current, and that's a time when you, you probably are going to be a little stressed physically. So knowing how to do this skill and being very comfortable in how to do this skill is going to be significant. Makes, really will make your life a lot easier. Yeah. So anyway, so and uh, along with that, I think also think that generally. It's you know it's uh, while diving is 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 generally a sport that is uh, that is accessible to everyone. Uh, it helps to have a certain basic level of fitness, you know. And actually, that's not just true for diving; it's just good in life as well. But you know, spend if you spend two or three uh, thirty-minute sessions a week working on your cardiovascular fitness, it'll stand you in a good stead when you're diving and when you're fighting a current or whatever. So, I mean, much as we would like to, to, to say that di diving is accessible to all, which it is. Uh, the fitter you are, Jenny, the better actually, the better you're able to cope with more challenging um, uh, circumstances you might face in the water, yeah? So to recap, what are the, ma the, the main physical skills that, that, that I think that, that, are, that are necessary to really evolve your diving skills are buoyancy, not just when moving, but also when stationary. Trim, which is your ability to hold any, to any body position in the water without struggling. Uh, equipment manipulation, which is being familiar enough with all your equipment that you can do it while distracted, whatever, and stressed out, and so on and so forth. Uh, and, and also dealing with specific emergency skills, like how to clear your mask, how to share air, uh, how to do a safety stop in the blue, and how to shoot a lift back. Yeah? So, okay, so that's the physical side covered, the skill side covered. Now, let's talk a little bit about equipment. And what, what, what I really mean here is you throw me all your money, we'll sell you equipment. No, no, no. This is actually not going to be a, a, a gear sales pitch. Um, this I'm doing with my instructor hat on, not with my sort of dive, you know, dive industry hat on. Um, it's, there's a, obviously, it's, it's, I, I'm a gadget head, right? Any of you who dealt with the equipment know that I, I, love, I, I love gear, I love talking about gear, and I love like sort of, you know, uh, playing around with dive equipment and a bunch of other stuff as well. Um, but there are some pieces of dive kit which actually significantly improve your comfort in the water. And for me, the first one actually is fins. Okay, the first one actually is a mask. That's fairly obvious, right? Uh, I actually, for some reason, this is the face of someone who is actually pretty good with all, almost all masks, except my nose. If you look at my profile here, this lumpy nose has been broken twice. Um, most, most masks that I buy will, will fit me fine, they won't leak, but they'll either pinch here or they'll pinch here. And after 45 minutes or one hour diving with someone pushing against here or pushing down here, I get really annoyed. So I actually like to have my own mask, which, uh, which, which actually fits my nose well, but I mean, whatever. Now I'm trying to grow a goatee, I may have to worry about make sure it doesn't leak here. Um, if, you're, if you have the type of face where, where you find it hard to get a mask that fits or leaks, you know, buy a mask. And it doesn't have to be the most expensive mask. Just buy a mask that fits you well <coughs> as the most important thing. Then you can worry about color and, uh, you know, other things later. But that's a fairly obvious fact, and most of us know that already. But I think what most people don't realize is the single biggest thing that actually affects your comfort in the water is your fins. <coughs> how many of you actually, when, last time you went diving, how many of you remember or re recall what brand of fins you wore? Very few, I imagine, right? Uh, and that's because you, you know, you're given a pair of fins and you go, hey, okay, I'll dive with these. Um, now, there's, okay, I, I'll, give, I'll give an, an, an example. I, uh, two years ago, I, I, we were on the dive out, outbound trip to Malapasco. Um, and I decided to, as to I just, being a gadget head, I, I decided to take two pieces of equipment to try out. One was an Aqualung Travel BCD, and one was a Tusa pair of split fins. Uh, these actually fins are disassembled and, and they basically fold into half. So very easy to pack and travel with. Uh, so I, was, I thought I'd take them both out and try them out in sort of real life conditions. And I had the most miserable week of diving imaginable. I felt like an open water diver because no matter what, I couldn't get my, my trim down. My legs just kept sinking. So I started to take pictures and my legs kept dropping. And it, I spent half my dive fighting my own buoyancy. Uh, and, and I spent more time worrying about that than sort of things around me. And that's, you know, that's, that's a feeling I've not felt for like, you know, almost 25, almost 30 years now. Um, so actually, that got me thinking a little bit about sort of you know we take fins for granted, but you know it's it's not just a matter of, of uh, how efficient you are in the water. Um, if it's a, like I said, fins have different cases. Some fins are lighter, some are heavier. Some fins require more leg effort to to kick, and some fins are are, are better when you kick sort of uh, 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 slower but uh, faster but with less power. Uh, for cyclists or runners, it's like having a high cadence versus low cadence. Uh, some fins are really suited to like slow, powerful kicks, and some are suited like shorter, faster easier kicks. Um, to which one you take really depends on your personal kicking style, your leg strength, whether you frog kick or flutter kick, etc. But um, uh, for example, I, because I cycle and I run, um, I have reasonably strong legs and I've also been a competitive swimmer in, in, in breaststroke. So I'm, I, I do the frog kick, that's very natural for me. Um, and I have, I, I, I'm able to turn a powerful and get nice powerful kicks with like really long stiff fins, which require a lot of force. 
Uh, you can't move them fast. You have to move them slowly but powerfully. They work really well for me. Uh, they don't really work well for most people because it's it, they actually they, even if I don't use those fins for a few months, if I go back to them, it's like oh wow, it takes a day or two to adjust. So other people might be might benefit from some softer fins, right, which are easier to kick. But you, you, you did it, did each kick requires less force, but you kick more often. So and so finding the kick that sort of the, the fin that sort of suits your kicking style is a, is really really important to in the water. Under calm conditions, probably not. But when you're fighting in a current. Trust me, there's nothing as bad as having a fin that feels too soft or too hard because then you just feel like, you know, you're not going anywhere. If, if it's too hard, you'll get cramps. If it's too soft, you'll run out of breath because you're going flap, 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 and the kicks, not, the fins are not moving you. So spend some time uh, trying out different fins and making sure, you know, you, you get something that, that's appropriate to your, to your kicking style. Um, whenever the lockdown ends, if, if we all don't become zombies by then, uh, we are going to have a set of trial fins, four or five fins that I think are the best, like a cover a wide range of situations. We'll have them for trial in our Delhi, Bombay, and uh, Chennai dive centers. And when we restart Bangalore, we'll have it there as well. So you're, if you're in those, those cities, you're welcome to come down, try them out in a pool, see which one works best for you. Uh, and the other part of fins is also, like I said, because uh, they, are, they are the furthest part from your center of gravity, the heavier light fin will, will also affect your trim to a significant degree, right? So spend some time, you know, making sure you, you dial your fins down because like, probably 70% of comfort in the water is going to come from fins. Yeah, I know. I, I, it took me by surprise as well, but I've realized that more and more from actually diving and also seeing pe you know, uh, uh, people diving on our outbound trips, etc., that, you know, some, just, just, as a simple thing, changing the fins has made a big difference in the comfort level. Uh, the second uh, bit of kit that, that's, that, uh, that also helps your comfort in the water is, is a BCD. Um, it, you know, honestly, in some ways, it's probably the most standardized piece of kit, right? It, it, Almost any BCD will do 90-95% of the job fairly well. Uh, you know, you, 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 you should be able to dive with any BCD that you can. Uh, where a, a nicer BCD will, will help is um, it, 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 by, it lets you, uh, it gives you more, more places to position your, uh, your weights. And the more position, the position you have to position your weights, the better you get in terms of, the better flexibility you have in terms of dialing in your trim perfectly. If I have a BCD, I need to get my weight somewhere around here and I know where to put it here, how am I going to get good trim? I'm going to have to do like a bodge, like having a, having a, a weight attached to, the, to my tank or strapping something or something, which is not that, 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 not that neat or tidy. Um, so so having, having a BCD with, with trim pockets and adjustable weights really goes a long ways towards making sure that you're able to get, uh, get your trim dialed on perfectly. And the second part of having your own BCD is, is that it's, it's, it's repetitive. Once you, let's say for, you, 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 you find out that I dive with three kilos, one kilo on my weight belt, one kilo on my, this, on, my, on my right trim pocket, and one kilo on my left trim pocket. In that case, pretty much any time you go diving somewhere, you, you know you need three kilos. Okay, assuming you have the same wetsuit. You don't have to figure out, oh, is this BCD lighter or, or, or more floaty or less floaty than the other one? Uh, how, how do I need to adjust my weights accordingly? It just takes that away. So, right? You go on a one week long dive holiday, you don't have to spend two of your seven diving days trying to dial down your trim or buoyancy. You just right from the get go, you're like, ah, you're nailed, you have it nailed down perfectly. And that, I mean, if you're diving a couple of times a year, you know, not, not wasting, let's say, four or six of your 20, 30 dives, it goes, you know, it, it's, a, it's a big benefit, yeah? So a BCD is, is, is it's, it, it's very useful in, in building that comfort in the water because you know, with your own BCD, you know exactly where to reach to find your dump valve, exactly where to reach to reach your inflator hose, exactly how much weight to add where, etc. So. And the last thing, is this is, and this is not necessarily related to, to improving your diving skills, but we'll, we'll talk about it when we get the mental aspect, is having your own dive computer. Now, okay, uh, what, what, what a dive computer really does is it gives you all the information that you need to manage your own dive skills, uh, at your dive, your, your, to manage your own dive yourself. You know your depth, you know your time, you know your NDL. If you're coming up, you know how fast you're coming up. If you actually go into decompression, you know how much time, you, how much deco time you need, etc. So with this, you are fully in control of your own safety, uh, depending on what circumstances, you know, what you need. You, you have the instrumentation that you need to get you out of any situation, to give, you have the instrumentation that will give you the information that will help you get out of almost any situation that you find yourself in. Yeah. So I think that if, if I had my way, I'd make it mandatory for almost every certified diver to own their own dive computer. And I own and not rent because <laughs> when you, again, I see this in every, every outbound trip I've led, I always tell people, guys, if you're renting a computer, read the manual before you come, get familiar with it. 
And almost every trip I've been on, before, like five minutes before the dive, there's someone who, who realizes they don't, they don't know how to set the nitrox, they don't know how this, uh, how the disp- what the display means and so on and so forth. Um, I can do my best, but I don't know every computer either. I mean, I, as I, my hair is getting gray, my memory is the second thing to go. Don't ask what the first is, I've forgotten. Um, so it's having one computer basically means, you, again, you know the characteristics of your computer, you know how to set it, um, you know what you, you know the, the quirks of it in terms of is it more conservative, is it less conservative, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so it's computers start at about twenty three, twenty four thousand. It's not a big okay. It's not cheap, but it's not a big investment considering that you know the last year, five, six, seven years. Um, I still have my computer that I bought in two thousand five, so fourteen years in some cases. Um, so yeah, that, it amortized over a number of years. Actually, it's like it can be pretty good value. So yeah, consider buying your own computer. And and, you, and this is not me selling you gear. Buy it from somewhere else. I don't really care. Just buy your own computer. It will make me happy there. Yeah. So, okay. So now that we've talked about the physical skill needed to become a, a good diver and the equipment needed to be, become a good diver, let me get to the last part, which is the mental skills, right? So I mean, I, I, most of you, I, as I, I always tell people to do my course, have you actually seen my instructor card? How many of you actually know, uh, how, how do you know for a fact that I'm an instructor and not just someone who's talking a lot of crap on the internet? I mean, yeah, believe it or not, people do talk crap on the internet. It took me by surprise as well. Have you seen my card? Do you know if I'm really an instructor? Do you know whether or not I got, I got kicked out of Paddy for being a drunkard or having a drug problem or whatever? Uh, do you know if I'm having a bad day because, you know, my, my wife was mean to me and she's sitting over here and she's, she's giving me mean looks? No, no, I, I'm kidding, dear. Seriously, don't hurt me after this. Don't hurt me the bird either. <laughs> So, I mean, you don't, the thing is, the, the point I'm trying to make is that uh, I may or may not be a dive instructor, but the point I'm trying to make is that you don't know that, you know, that, that, the, that, the, that the dive professional is taking care of you, whether he's any good or not, or he could be a good dive professional having a bad day. He could be a good dive professional having a good day, but he could still be, sort of, his attention is still sort of split over all the people in the group. The only person who cares as much for your safety in the water is you and maybe your mother, but she, if she's not diving with you, it's just you. It's, the DMs, dive professionals, obviously we do take, when we dive, we, 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 we do take, we are very sort of invested in making sure divers are safe. But if I'm diving with four people, you guys are getting about, you know, maybe 20% of my time. If each of you gets 20%, I get 20%. You, on the other hand, have 100% of your attention devoted to yourself. So the, the, uh, the, la- the best thing you can do to becoming a better diver, to is utilizing all the skills that you, that, you, that you learned earlier, is actually switch your brain on when you go diving. Okay. And when I say switch your brain on, the first thing is just understand that you, when you're diving, you are, in, you are in responsible for your own safety. Um, I, I, I know I'm, I'm, I, I'm not always the most uh, uh, patient of instructors, as many of the stu- people who've done their DM courses with me have, have realized. But um, this is many years ago, 2004, I think, we just, we just, we were one year, into, we just started diving about a one year. Um, and I had this, this woman come up to me, she was diving with us, and she came and said, you know, I'm, I, I won't talk to you about your dive masters. I'm like, okay. Uh, they're, I mean, they're not very good. And this actually took me by surprise, because the DM she was with was, is actually one of the best dive masters I've encountered in my life. He's, he's epic. I mean, he, he dwarfs, you know, people like me in, in terms of his, he, he just, he's fantastic. Isn't he? So yeah, I'm like, what happened? She goes, well, I was at, I was at, I was at I, he was diving, he never, che- he never asked me my air. Um, he asked me once, and then he never checked my air again. I was at, I, I was at fifty, as sixty bar, he didn't check. I was at fifty bar, he didn't check. And we came. I mean, how much did you come up with? We came up with forty-five. So I mean, okay. Actually, I spoke to DM later. He said he could see a gauge, so he knew much how much air he had. But that's a different story. Uh, what took me by surprise is that this is a rescue diver who's actually upset that the dive master did not come and check her air. And I, I mean, it took me all my willpower at the time to sort of not. Uh, to, to, to actually in th- to act like a, a, a professional as opposed to just a. a, a <laughs> okay, let's just say it took a lot of willpower for me just not, uh, not to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, 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 to not challenge her. Like, you know, if you're a certified diver, let alone a rescue diver, you should never be in a position where you're going to go, hey, the dive master is not, uh, is not checking my head. It's not the dive master's job. Dive masters may, will do it, for sure. But that, think of that as a safety net. Don't rely on the safety net. You are in charge of your own safety. You are in charge of, of managing all your, 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 your dive profile, your air, your, your depth, your NDL, etc. It's not the dive master's job. Keep in mind, when you dive, no matter what goes happen, barring any active act of malevolence on the part of the dive professional, if you get hurt, it is your fault for putting yourself in that situation. If you take this to heart and plan every dive accordingly, you will have taken the single biggest step towards becoming a better diver. I cannot say this often, and I don't care if this is upsets you and you go, Vinny, screw you, we'll never dive with Dive India again. No. I mean, you are responsible for your own safety, and I genuinely think that if you're not capable of doing that, you shouldn't be diving. 
I'm sorry, this is maybe this may be tactless, but I think it's really important. Take ownership of your own safety when you dive. And like I said, that's where having the computer helps, right? Because when you have the computer, there's no excuse. You can't go, oh, the dive master had the computer. I didn't know how deep I was. I didn't know my NDL, etc. Take ownership of the computer. And here's a few things that, that, that I think will also help you when it comes to sort of taking ownership of your own safety. The first part is stress recognition and, and, and solving. What do I mean by that? So, you know, I, I see this often. I'm diving. Hey, guy, are you okay? Yeah, yeah I'm good. Uh, I see people are looking obviously visibly stressed about something either before the dive or during the dive and ask them, are you okay? And they give me an okay sign. Uh, I don't know why. This, is, it, is it a failure to realize that they're stressed? Possibly. Is it a, is it a, a, a stubbornness towards, to, towards you know, a, a, some desire to not talk about the stress to other people? Also possibly. Is it a desire to solve the problem themselves? Possibly. Regardless of how or what the issue is, the first part, you have to be honest with yourself and say, hey, is something stressing me? And when I say stress, it could be physical stress. It could be something like your wetsuit is too tight or your mask is pinching your, 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 your lumpy nose or something or, or, or whatever. Um, or it could be mental stress. It could be, you know, I mean, you, you, you go, you go, you've gone on a dive holiday, you've gone on a dive uh, trip with your buddy or your wife or your, or your husband or whatever. And you're out there, you're on a dive boat with, with five, six other people and just and you, you don't need a wet blanket. Okay, let me give you a story here, right? Um, many years ago, I had gone, uh, I was diving in Koh Tao in Thailand with a friend of mine who's got a dive center there. And he just discovered a shipwreck uh, in about 52 meters of water, about two hours outside, uh, away from the, from, the, uh, from the island. And he asked me if I wanted to go dive. I'm like, yeah, sure, I'd love to do this dive. Uh, so it was a tech dive, obviously. So you know, he, he said, we're gonna dive with like um, the two gas mixes we're gonna be diving with. And, and he said, okay, come in the morning, there'll be an uh, analyzer on the boat and you can check your mixes on the boat. Great. So one of the rules of any kind of mixed gas diving is you test the gas yourself. So I get in the morning at like 4.30 or 5, like half awake. Uh, I get in the boat and I sleep and we travel for about two hours and we get to the dive site, okay, let's get ready. So I get up and like, hey, where's the analyzer? They look for it and they go, oh, we forgot. Uh, we forgot to bring it, but that's, that tank is 50%, that tank is 100%. So now imagine this, I'm here on a boat, I'm with, with, with my friend, who's, and it's one of the big Thai, boat, Thai boats that can take about 20, 30 people. He's brought it all the way to this dive site just for me. We're at the dive site, and I can't test my mixes. So the sensible thing to do at this point would be to go, hey, you know what, I'm not going to do the dive. And to my eternal shame, I actually did the dive. And I did the dive knowing fully well that it was a tremendously bad decision. It was something that sort of that, that if I actually if, if he was mistaken and if I if I put the hundred percent in the mouth at twenty one meters I would die I would get oxygen toxicity I would become unconscious and I would die um, and, but that, just at that time I did not want to be the that guy I don't be the guy who's trying to be too precious or whatever and throughout the entire dive I cursed myself it's now been this was I think two thousand and six it's been fourteen years since it happened even today I cringe when I think of that and I think that that incident was the biggest sort of like a uh, some switch flicked on in me at that point that I go, you know, was this worth dying for? No. I mean, the thing is, okay, that's obviously an extreme example, but the, my point is that when you dive, you're often going to be faced in situations where you have, to, you, 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 have to put, you have to balance your own personal discomfort with the ease of the people around you. And the, my, the, the standard I always refer to people is, ask yourself, that is this something that you, you want to risk being, being injured for, being hospitalized for, even worse? And in, in almost every case, I guarantee you the answer is going to be no. So don't let peer pressure get to you, right? Just be aware, be, understand what, what, what's causing you to become stressed, what's causing you to become nervous, and make sure that is addressed before you get in the water. If it's an equipment piece, hey, this is not working, can, can you help me with it? If it's you know, something as nebulous, like, oh, it's going to be strong current, can I do this or not? Ask. And don't just say, oh, you'll be fine. Ask for specific information on what are the, so, you know, hey, it's a strong current, I don't know if I can do this. Okay, the answer might be, listen, you put on your gear in the water, jump in the water, and hold the line. Can you do that? Yes. Pull yourself up to the front of the boat. Can you do that? Yes. Grab the line, descend holding out the line. Can you do that? Yes. And once you have the line, at the bottom, the current will be less, you stay close to the bottom and we'll swim. Can you do that? Yes, maybe. What if I get tired? If you get tired, we'll come up. Okay, I can do that. Or you might decide, hey, you know what, maybe this, uh, this one step in the process sounds like too much work, I don't want to do it. Either way, now what you've done is you've taken that nebulous stress and you've, 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 you've figured out what are the steps that you need to solve it. And you, have to, you can decide, for, yes, I can do these things, or no, I, don't, I can't do these things, or I don't want to do these things. Either way, you've taken, you've, what you've done is you've transferred the responsibility for executing the dive from someone else and you've brought it upon yourself, which is the safe way to do it. And always, if you're not sure, don't push yourself, yeah? 
Link, uh, speaking of pushing yourself, the second, um, ment- the second sort of sk- mental sort of skill to develop is understanding your personal limits. Okay, it's, I um, mean, it's, I've had, <laughs> I'm not really covering myself with glory here. I've had one case where I've actually, the one time I've lost, I've, lo- I've lost it with a student and gone to profanity list. Actually, profanity list I read with him on a crowded boat. Was, anyway, there's a diver who, who had an ear injury, kept diving, didn't tell me about it, went back diving, went off by himself. Because he had an overinflated sense of sort of what he could tough through. Um, no, I mean, the thing is now, I'm not saying avoid risk entirely. If you wanted to avoid risk entirely, you would be at home in a bubble, you know, in lockdown for, the, for your entire life, not just these 21 days, right? When you go diving, you take a risk. When you go diving, to, to, you know, to, to like 20 meters, to, instead of 5 meters, you take a risk. It's not my job to tell you how much risk you should take. That's you, that's an adult. My job is to make sure that you take an informed risk. To take an informed risk, you need, there's a few things you need to understand. You need to understand what, what are the actual risks, what are, what, what, what are the things that can go wrong. You need to understand what are, the, what are the likelihood of them going wrong, right? Because just because there's two possible risks doesn't mean that they're both equal. When I dive, the risk of, let's say, getting knocked at, 30 me- at 40 meters is higher than the risk of being attacked by you know, five killer sharks with lasers on their head. Right? So, and so when, it, when it comes to risk prioritization, risk management, I, I plan accordingly. The third thing to that is, so it's just not the risk, the probability of the risk is a solution. What can you actually do if something were to go wrong? Right? And this comes from your knowledge, your dive skills, and courses that you may have done or whatever. And the last, and this is the way the thing sort of the hinge upon, is are you actually able to do this when the poop hits the fan? And this is something you will not know until you've actually been in, a situa- in that situation. My thing is, uh, uh, <laughs> There's a very nice phrase. That is, good judgment comes from experience. Experience comes from bad judgment. So, uh, and hopefully, you, your bad judgment ends up being a learning, uh, being a learning experience, and not, let's say, a, a statistic causing incident. But uh, um, it's, it's one thing to know that if I run out of air 20 meters and there's no one, no one next to me, I can do an emergency swimming ascent. You know, I drop my weight belt, I swim, I go, ah, and I swim up. Great, that's very nice. But imagine, if, can you actually do it? When, the, the, when, it, when, it actually ha- when, when you're actually alone at 20 meters, you've exhaled, you've inhaled, you've got a mouthful of water. Now, will you remember to go up and, you know, and maybe remember to exhale in the, any air you have in your lung? Maybe you can, maybe you can. But so having a very realistic idea of what you can actually pull off is, is really important because that defines what your boundaries are. And I encourage people to, to sort of expand their boundaries, but do it in a controlled manner in, 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 in a setting where they, you have some backup. Uh, don't just randomly decide, you know, hey, I've died to 30 meters once, it's been okay, I've died to 30 meters twice, let's go to 50 meters tomorrow, because hey, what, what the hell, can, you know, that makes a difference. So understanding your, your, your personal limits and, and, coming and pushing them in a controlled manner is a, is a very important part of becoming a better diver and also becoming a safe diver while you try to improve, yeah? Uh, so the, I've already talked about awareness and ownership of one's personal safety, so, you know, I'm not going to stress that topic anymore, but... Uh, so all of this really involves it. every time you go diving, it should just be like, you know, what do I need to do to, to, to do this dive? What, what are the question marks? Ask questions. If you, sometimes you, maybe you don't hear the, the DM, you're not clear on it. Everyone is probably going, yeah, yeah, okay, okay. And you're going, is it just me? I didn't understand a word he said. And it's happened to me on briefings as well. I mean, I, I go to, especially when you go diving in other parts of the world where the dive guides are not always fluent in English. Um, sometimes you have to like pay careful attention and you, you just fine. Either do it in front of others, or if you want, you can pull them aside later. Hey, listen, I didn't understand this. Can you tell me again? I can assure you, from speaking with a professional hat on, if I, I, I love it when, dive, when, 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 when divers come to me and go, I, I didn't understand this. Can you explain? Because what a diver who does that is a diver I know is actually paying attention and has his brain switched on. And nothing will make you a better diver than having your brain switched on in every dive that you do. Yeah? So that ends my, my, my sermon for the day. And I just have a few questions over here about sort of if someone is asking about. Uh, uh, how to choose it? Uh, let me just quickly go through the comments here. Someone asked about guidelines to buy a dive computer. Um, it's it's a it's a few things with, with dive computers. A few things to look for is that, I mean, that, that the the basic thing you obviously want on all, with all dive computers is. Uh, it, it should give you, it should give you your, your, your system of depth, no decompression time, etc. Uh, these days, it's almost every dive computer has nitrox. I personally would not buy a dive computer which does not have nitrox because, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's significantly limited. I don't think there's any computer these days that doesn't have nitrox, actually, come to think of it. 
the few other attributes that I think are important. One is a size. Um, like I, I, this is actually not dive compared to watch. I like a watch size form factor because when I'm diving. When I take, if I come up from a dive, I take off my wetsuit. I can keep the watch. I can keep the, the dive computer on. I don't have to take off my, my, my computer first. Because the moment you take off your computer, it's lying on the side. It can, it can fall. It can, someone can put some dive equipment on it, etc. It's an invitation to get lost. Um, the other features are, I think, you know, is, is, it, is it designed for decompression diving? Like for example, I'm a tech diver. I did my Trimix course back in like sort of in dinosaurs rule the year 2000, no, 1998 or something like that. Seven, I think. Um, so I, 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 I still do I, I still go tech diving every so often, not as much as I like of late. But uh, so I, I want to have a computer which is actually good for decompression diving. Um, so if you if you if you if you decide that you are going to go in, get go down the tech path sometime down the road, you might want to get a computer that is tech capable. For example, Suunto computers are are designed for tech diving. Um, uh, uh, Maris I think Maris and Aqualung computers are not. But for recreational dive, if you don't plan to do tech diving, then you know it doesn't really matter so much. Another proof is, is how conservative is the computer. Suntos tend to be super conservative, which is really good if you if you have let's say if you're on, on one end of the bell curve where you have a high risk factor for diving. Uh, other people actually prefer computers which have a, which are not as conservative. Uh, so that's that's something. Uh, some people prefer being able to tweak the the, the the algorithm a little bit. That's another thing to think about. Uh, for me, a couple of nice things to have, which I, and if budget allows, which I encourage you to pay a little bit extra for, is having a built-in compass into your computer. That's very nice to have because sometimes if you're diving, and you, it's just very nice when you go to take a bearing before you start, so you have an idea of approximately where you're going. So in case you get lost or something, you have a roughly idea of which way to go back to as well. So having a, I mean, almost every dive I do, I sort of just take a quick heading. Okay, now I'm going north, now I'm going east, or whatever, and I have a, an approximate map in my head of where the boat is. Yeah, and I don't think it's exactly over there. It could just be like it's somewhere in that quadrant. And that's good enough. And another nice, uh, nice thing to have is sort of air integration, which is that's definitely very nice to have. It's not essential by any means, but it's kind of cool to have. Just look at your computer and also see how much air you have, how far how, your breathing rate, and so on and so forth. It's kind of um, so, uh, so. Yeah. So those are the, those are the sort of features that I look for in a computer. At, at the essential one is obviously nitrox. Very nice to have is a is a is a digital compass, and um, uh, this nice to have is air integration. Form factor, go with one, one that feels nice to you. Also make sure the interface is logical. I, I'm, I personally am not a big fan of one button dive computers because it just feels very clunky to me. Uh, some people like them. Uh, I never used to like two button dive computers either till I got my shear water. And the, the logic on that is really simple. So it's, it's very easy to use. So make sure also you have a computer where you don't have to like, every time you dive, you not be like, oh geez, how do I set it now? Um, to make sure it's a computer where the settings are easy. You, you understand and, and know how to, how to set it. And, okay? So those are the questions. Okay? Yeah, so Mohit's asking me, when do we make it to Neil and replacement battery? Uh, which, which, which di Mohit, just message me which dive computer that you have. Ask uh, so for when to make it to Neil. Dude, we're all, we're all stuck in Neil and have a like, waiting for you, man. So come on over. Um, Someone made a comment here on it. <coughs> yeah. As, uh, yeah, yeah, where to buy dive computers? Like I said, uh, unfortunately, we do sell dive computers, and they start at about twenty three, twenty four thousand. Honestly, if you like, I said, as 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 Vinit said, if you buy, if you're going out of the country, you can get you can get basic models for really cheap for about eleven, twelve thousand in clearance. Um, obviously, now if you if you if you buy it here, you get full warranty, etc. So that that's that's a matter of uh, you know what uh, of how how you want to place sort of upfront savings versus warranty savings. That's up to you. Uh, dun, 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 dun. Jan was saying that yeah, he has a, uh, to, to placing the gauges in a, in a place where you can see them exactly. So yeah, it's also a, um, one very interesting thing. Uh, when you, after you dive for so anyway, so I was going to talk about sort of, you know, a few a few. So we've talked about all the things that you can do to improve your dive skills, right? So here's a couple of exercises that you can try every time you go diving. The first is <coughs> five minutes into dive, look at your, look at your computer or uh, see see what at what depth you're at, and look at your gauge and see how much air you have. After ten minutes. Try to guess and see see how much air, how much air you've used. And it, before looking at a guess, say you had 190 10 minutes ago. I should have about 165, 170. And look and see how close you are. Play this game about two three times every dive, and you'll find after about as little as a you know four five days, you, you you start to have a good idea of how much air you're using. Another thing to do is on the, when you come up from your dive, I'd say the dive is over. It's time to go up. Okay. So now at that point, look at your look at your depth uh, and, and and how much air you have. So let's say it could be you could have 50 bar in your tank and you're starting to come up from 15 meters. When you get to the surface, make a note of how, how much air you used. So I used about 20 bar to come up from 15 meters, including the safety stop. Make a note of it in your logbook. 
And just a few times, again, what happens then is you get an idea of how much air you need to come up from a given depth. And that's really nice to have. If at 30 meters, uh, uh, let's say 25 meters and your tank says, oh shit, I have 55 bar. Oops, am I going to make it a surface or not? If you've done this exercise, you know, hey, I need about 20 bar to come up from, 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 from this depth, so I'm okay. You don't need to panic, you can come up nice and slow. Or it might be that, hey, you know what, I'm actually pushing the limits a little bit, I need to go up a bit faster. In which case, you might come up a little bit faster than normal and maybe do an abbreviated safety stop. So these are little things that are, that are nice to have. That, uh, that, that, uh, this is a little, nice little exercise that you can do every time you dive where, where, where to, to sort of figure out your air consumption. Uh, the safety stop, the three minutes that you do a safety stop, fantastic place to work on your, on your, on your, on your dive skills. A uh, couple of things, try this. Have someone watch over you, close your eyes and spend about, take about five breaths and try to see if you can maintain your, 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 your buoyancy without visual cues. That's really hard to do, so maybe save that for later. That's okay for, for all you guys who are advanced divers with 50, 60, 100 plus dives, this could be something for you guys to try. For those of you guys who are relatively new to diving, try the, at, just at a safe, instead of holding onto the line, let go of the line. Find a fixed point, maybe a diver or something who's all and just try to just make sure you can, you can hover while keeping them, uh, using them as a reference. Or if there's no reference, look at your computer gauge as well. Don't look at another diver floating in the blue because they could be going up and you could be looking at them going, aha, I'm at the same depth and before you know it, you're both at the surface. So try holding a safety stop in the blue without a line. And that's a really good skill to have and without adjusting your BC, just using your lungs. As you go up, exhale, feel, try to f figure out, feel, f uh, Get a sense of what it feels like when you're going up. Get a sense of what it feels like when you're descending. And use that to sort of, you know, as you're going up, exhale, wait, come down. And once you start to come down, inhale, wait, come up. So uh, this is a great place to work on your static buoyancy. Yeah. And, then, and then apply this every time you're diving as well. Uh, third exercise to play, to play this is you just make sure you loop the, you clue in the DM, is that every at, have the dive master randomly ask you every 15 minutes of dive approximately where the boat is. And you should have an idea in approximately which quadrant the boat is. And you know, that, that helps you have an idea when you're diving of roughly where you're going, which way the boat is, and so on and so forth. It generally improves your overall spatial awareness. Because let's face it, all of us, when we go, even I, this is true for me, when I go diving, I have a dive guide have, and I follow the dive guide. Um, if I'm going diving, I have my camera with me, I want to take pictures, I'm not necessarily always paying attention to sort of, you know, exactly the exact route we're taking. But I like to have a rough idea that, you know, in case it's a giant hand comes in the water and scoops out the, the DM, first I'll panic, like, who does the giant hand belong to? Then I'll say, okay, where's the boat? I can swim back to the boat. The approximately, at least I know I'm swimming in the rough direction of the boat and not away from the boat. It's a good level of awareness to have as well. So these are a few things that you can practice in every dive that you do, uh, and that sort of improve your, uh, your, your, uh, your, your diving skills. Also use that time to practice clearing your mask, air exchange, etc. Once you get really comfy with that, what you can actually do is even practice taking your BCD on and off underwater. Right? I mean, the practical implication of this is relatively low, but at least it builds that comfort level. That, hey, I, I can maintain my buoyancy in blue water without any holding onto something while task loaded with taking my BCD on and off. That's a great confidence builder. And it's actually a really good test of your buoyancy skills as well. So work on these skills, slowly keep progressing, uh, make it a bit harder, make it a bit harder, and, and you know, you'll find your skills improving with every dive. Um, okay, and then someone, so this question was, so I was asking, like, Arush was asking, what is the ideal weight? Arush, there's no ideal weight. That, that's what, it really depends on, on a bunch of factors, right? It uh, depends on, uh, your, obviously, your height and weight, what kind of BCD you're using, what kind of wetsuit you're using, also your, your, your body composition. Um, you know, generally, uh, women tend to more floaty bits than men, yeah, for the floaty bits. They tend to mean, for the, same, for the same height and weight, women will use more, weight, more weights than guys. Also, depending on bone density and a bunch of factors, the, the best way to actually figure out your buoyancy is to is actually test it in the water. And the the, the, the standard way that most people use is you know uh, anyway, the bunch of methods. The, the best and the, the most direct way to measure your, your 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 the right amount of weight that you need at the end of the dive with your tank at 50 bar. If you have more than 50 bar, hold your regulator in the water, press perch, bring it down to 50 bar. Anywhere between 30 and 50 is fine. Empty the tank from your BCD, you should be neutrally buoyant. So if you lock your hands here, lock your ankles together so you're not kicking, close your eyes just to prevent distraction, exhale, you'll sink. Inhale, you'll come up. When you do three, four of these inhale and exhales, and the fourth time you inhale, you should be pretty much right at the surface. Uh, if you find that every time you inhale, you drop, every breath cycle you keep dropping, 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 glug, 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 you're too heavy. Then take one kilo off and repeat. So the only so that's the that's the most precise way to dial down the exact amount of weight that you use, yeah. So 
And once you have the weight down, then you figure out the distribution later. Any question? <coughs> Mohit says, yeah, I've, lost, I've seen people lose a sense of depth while deploying the SMB. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, you know, so, so Mohit, the, the SMB deployment, it's, 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 what's, it's, it's a matter of task loading, right? <coughs> Here's what happens. And maybe you guys will relate to this. Do you, you guys remember in open water when you did the first the neutral buoyancy exercise fin pivot? And you were doing it to find bathing in, go, uh, breathe, breathe in, come up, breathe out, going down. It's working really well. Then the moment you start swimming, you go up. Uh, or, so what happens is when you actually, when you focus on your buoyancy, everything is good. You focus, okay, I'm exhaling, I'm inhaling, la, 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 I'm good. The moment you get distracted by something else, your brain, you, when, you, when your brain focuses on something, there, sometimes you tend to hold your breath and not breathe, breathe as deeply. Right? I mean, think about this. When you, what happens like when you gasp or, or you, you focus on something, your, 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 your breathing pattern changes. When your breathing pattern changes, then you, you lose your buoyancy. So what hap when, when shooting an SMB, SMB is actually fairly complicated to use in some ways. You, know? you have to unfold that lift bag. You have to make sure that it's all looped in. There's a bunch of stuff you're doing with your hands. And you're concentrating on that. Because you're concentrating on that, you're not exhaling as deeply. And because you're not exhaling as deeply, you tend to float up. So that is why all these exercises I mentioned earlier about sort of, you know, learning to sort of manipulate your equipment, uh, practicing your buoyancy till it becomes second nature. So uh, uh, once all of that happens, then, they, then this becomes easier because there's something called a muscle memory, so, in, in, uh, so a condition reflex. So when I, for me, for example, when I'm working on my buoyancy, it's not something I have to think about. Am I going up when I need to exhale? No, it's, it's conditioned in my, in my muscle memory, so it bypasses the cognitive parts of my brain. So when I, whether I'm, whatever I'm doing, I, my, 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 the reflexive part of my brain automatically knows to regulate my, my, my buoyancy. So when I'm focused on, let's say, doing, tying a knot underwater or opening an SMB or whatever, my breathing pattern remains the same. Or if I start to go up, reflexively, my, my brain recognizes I'm going up and it exhales and bringing back down. For someone who's new to this, for, for whom the buoyancy is still not second nature, if they're not actively paying attention to the buoyancy, they'll tend to rise up. So the, yeah, there's no sort of shortcut to this other than just being aware of sort of what's happening and uh, and making sure that you know you, you you build up your buoyancy to the point that it becomes second nature and you're able to hold your buoyancy while being task loaded with sort of whatever taking your BCD on and off or shooting SMB or whatever. <coughs> okay, one last question. Uh, Reniko is asking that I, I consume more air than fellow, fellow divers, significantly reducing my bottom. How can I fix this? Okay, so you know, really, there's a bunch of things here. Now, obviously, again, uh, there's, a, there's a genetic factor as well. I'm a big guy. I'm 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 I'm, I'm sixty. I'm, like I said, I'm six feet tall, about 80, 83 and a half kilos. It's going to be eighty soon. Um, so I have big lungs. So I tend to use air faster than other people. I I tend to use air more. I should, right? But I find when I dive that I, for the most part, actually, I I use I I, I use my that my air consumption a lot less. So I think that while genetic factors do play a role, um, your comfort in the water is probably what, what makes, the, makes the biggest difference in, in, in your air consumption. And your comfort in the water really comes from when you really dial down your buoyancy. I suspect with most people when they're swimming, you're swimming while slightly heavy. So because you're swimming while slightly heavy, part of your kick is propelling you upwards. That's not efficient. Right? If, if, if I'm heavy and I'm, I have to do a little bit of work every time to keep myself off the bottom, I'm going to use up more air. So that's that's probably that's one thing that contributes to your to your uh, to, to 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 increase air consumption. Generally, not so good trim trim is if you're swimming horizontally, and your body tends to be like this. A part of you is subconsciously trying to keep your legs off off the ground, and you're kicking, and you're using a bit of energy to do that as well. The best way to to actually to get your good body is just relax in the water, and just slow down and just just exhale and relax, and see what happens. If your buoyancy and trim are right, you'll just stay where you are. You inhale, exhale, and then throw in one kick. Inhale, exhale, throw in one kick. So try that exercise next time you're diving. You know, uh, if you want to do it in a pool, you're welcome to come join us in, in Chennai or wherever. Or next time you're going diving somewhere on a checkout dive or whatever. Or if you have a, if they have access to a shore dive, just go out there and work on your and just work on sort of slowing down in the water. Uh, no, and just making sure that when you relax and, and, don't, and, and, and stop kicking, your body stays where it is. If you find your body tends to sink, that's probably one of the things that is contrib contributing to your, uh, to your greater air consumption. And obviously, you don't use your hands and move as slowly as possible. So, <laughs> Abhishek, no, it's not a dry cough. It's, uh, yeah. I've, had, I've had this like flammy cough for the last week and a half or so as well. So, no, don't worry. So, that's it, guys. Thank you for watching. I hope you found this useful. Uh, yeah, and obviously, like um, if this thing ends and you want to work on any of your buoyancy skills, I'm, I'm I'll be teaching in Chennai for till 
at least for the foreseeable future till the end of this year. And then I might be moving to Bangalore. I'll be, I'll be, I'll be doing diving there. And obviously, you're welcome to come join us in the Andamans. God knows we'd love to have you there. All the staff is cooped up there in, in, in Havelock, all, all in the resort, 36 people in the resort. And I think cabin fever is starting to set in. They'd be very happy to see other people. And like I said, drop us a message if you have any questions. I'm doing a repeat of this session on Instagram on Saturday. So if you know someone who's interested or would be interested, I'd really appreciate if you give it a share. I'll be covering the same topics there. And then we'll be putting a video of this online if you want to get back to it as well. So dive safe and hopefully we'll see you when, the, when, this, when this whole thing ends. And hopefully you guys will not be zombies by then. Yeah. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.